Hello, my name's Hoa and I work for Arup Lighting in the Melbourne office in Australia. I'd first like to give my thanks to Sharon and Martin from Light Collective and Women in Lighting for giving me the opportunity to speak at this fantastic event. I feel like every day should be Women's Day and it's great that we can all come together globally to celebrate together on this day. To begin, um, unlike New Zealand, Canada and the United States, Australia doesn't have a treaty with its Aboriginal people. So I'd like to start my presentation with an acknowledgement of country to recognise Aboriginal people as the first Australians and custodians of the land on which our work is conducted. And in the spirit of reconciliation, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I pay my respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to any Indigenous people in attendance today. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Today I'm going to present on a research project that the lighting team in Arup, Melbourne completed in 2019 in an academic research partnership with XYX Lab at Monash University here in Melbourne, Australia. Back in 2016, XYX Lab, which is a research PhD lab at Monash University in collaboration with Plan International, asked young women and girls in Melbourne to share their experience of the city. They did this through a crowdsourcing app called the Free to Be campaign, where people were able to go on and pin specific sites and add comments to where they felt um, safe or where they experienced harassment or assault across Melbourne. The app was online for three months and collected a data set of over 900 pins. This is a screen grab of what was collected. So the red dots are the unsafe sites and the green dots are the safe sites. The bigger the circle, the higher the number of people who pinned it as a safe or unsafe site. This study in Melbourne was a prototype and similar studies have been conducted in five other cities worldwide, uh, including Delhi, Madrid, Lima, Kampala and Sydney with each study collecting over 3,000 people's responses. Our physical abilities, the way we look and past experiences can all affect the way we move around a city. It influences whether you avoid a certain part of the city, feel comfortable using social amenities like public transport, or even leave the house after dark at all. The latest OECD study found that only 68% of the general population feel safe when walking alone at night. There are huge social and economic consequences if people don't feel safe enough to walk around alone at night. The experience of feeling unsafe is widely known. The data set collected from the Free to Be campaign is the first time so much rich qualitative experiences have been digitally collected and linked to physical attributes to specific sites in the city. This type of crowdsourcing method offers opportunities to be more inclusive during the design process and provides a more holistic picture of marginalised experiences so that designers aren't only relying on official crime statistics, which often don't capture things like harassment or abuse as they often go unreported. It also allows designers to be on the front foot of shaping a more inclusive environment instead of going in to mitigate after something awful has already happened. When the results from the Free to Be campaign were released, I noticed that over 300 pins across Melbourne specifically mentioned lighting as a contributing factor to feeling safe or unsafe. The city and our experiences of public space works as a system of layers. At night, light is the one thing that allows for all of these layers to work seamlessly together by giving us vision. Considered lighting, will allow us to enjoy our public spaces at night, while bad lighting can make a space feel harsh and unfriendly. What we're still yet to understand as an industry is measured evidence that shows how specific elements of light makes women and girls feel when they say that it's bad or good, beyond, oh, it's, it's too dark or too bright. 
So we got in touch with XYX Lab and were very grateful to be able to start a research collaboration with them to see if we could add some quantitative measurements to figure out a nuanced way of what it is exactly that makes women and girls feel safe or unsafe from lighting in the city. We picked 84 sites where the data showed hotspots from the community feedback and also places where people specifically mentioned lighting. Over four weeks between 9pm and 3am in the sweaty Melbourne summer, um, a colleague of mine and I went out and measured 84 sites in total, 26 safe spots and 58 unsafe spots. So to put this research into context, it's vital to consider how external spaces are currently lit. So the Australian standards focus heavily on the evenness and intensity of light falling on a surface. This is otherwise known as the illuminance levels or lux falling onto a surface, as you can see in the image on the left. What the standards don't take into account is the human experience of how we see light, which we measured with luminance and post-processed in radiance. Our hypothesis for the research was that we should be measuring more than just illuminance to take into account the overall context of a site and include things like different road colours, finishes or ambient light from shop fronts, which can all add up to our perception of comfort and safety in the city. We measured and analysed eight different technical lighting parameters per site, where, where if you were um, meeting compliance, you'd only measure a fraction of these technical elements. We then also analysed the sites with the help of our in-house human factors specialists, which is essentially looking at the vulnerability for things like the scales of architecture, adjacencies, footpath width, um, sight lines and escape routes. This is a key part of investigating experiences of the night because a large part of light is only experienced when it bounces off the surrounding environment. Of the 38 different physical attributes we looked at, the four here on the slide were found to be uh, statistically significant. So our findings validated our hypothesis and also debunked some long held assumptions about how lighting can make a space feel safer. We found that brighter lights don't make people feel safer. So in general, once light levels reach a certain threshold, a space will start to feel unsafe. Currently, a common knee-jerk reaction for many asset owners is to add more lights to make a space feel safer. What the data shows is that this is generally not true. We also found that quality, not quantity, is much more important when it comes to urban lighting. The findings show that the quality of light output is much more important once a low level of light is reached. One of these factors is colour rendering, which is how accurate colour is rendered by the light source compared to what it appears to be during daylight. This allows for people to be able to accurately see shapes and colour and to distinguish the difference between a person that's approaching them and the bush that's beside them. Our findings show that being able to see and make out an overall scene in front of you is much more important to women and girls than only being able to see um, and make out someone's facial expressions as they're approaching. Area and context. What, what was overwhelmingly common as well was that safer spaces tended to have much warmer light. You can see this here um, in the image of a Melbourne laneway, which has a beautiful warm glow, and there's um, a layering effect going on with the shop lighting, the wall lighting, and an uplit focal point at the back that's Flinders Street Station. The data set has shown that people prefer to dwell longer in warm flame-like colours at night. Currently, with smart cities and LED technology, we're starting to see more and more colder temperature lights being installed. Our findings show that um, while this type of colour temperature might be good for cars and energy efficiency, it doesn't make pedestrians feel safer. While additional research is required to drive firm changes in policy, the findings from this preliminary study have allowed us to define a baseline that's, cre uh, that's required for a space to feel safe for young women and girls in Melbourne. It also suggests that the lighting standards and practices as they exist at the moment 
may not be considering the diversity of experiences that are out there. With this data set, uh, we've started to overlay other information on a GIS map, such as tree coverage, acoustics and pedestrian movement, to see if there are any correlations between things that we haven't been able to uncover in the past. Ultimately, over time, with the layering of all this digital data, we'll be able to make holistic design decisions that we know will create safer, more equitable and inclusive cities for the future. Since this research project, we've developed an evidence-based methodology called the Nighttime Vulnerability Assessment, also known as the NVA, which we offer to our clients, such as local councils or developers, as the first step to implementing an evidence-based process when developing a nighttime strategy or master plan, all in the pursuit of designing for more inclusive nighttime environments. In a world that's waking up to all the different permutations of social injustice and inequity, this project has really allowed us at Arab to completely turn the, tr the traditional lighting design process on its head and pioneer new digital methods of inclusive and experience-based nighttime design for people. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>